Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amrita, and I'm here from Boston. I am a software engineer by profession. I worked for uh, seven plus years as a software engineer, and now I have Startup Now and Startup. Today I'll be talking about Agile software development practices, uh, lean startup principles, and how they uh, work well together with, with lean UX. So a little bit about my background. I recently founded my company. It's called Date My Wardrobe. It's like Airbnb for wardrobe items, uh, based in the US and Boston. Um, I have my master's in information technology from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. and. Uh, now I am a part-time student doing my human factors and information design um, at the same university. I was a software engineer for seven plus years at Fidelity Investments, uh, where I basically worked on the back end. And then I also worked as a UX research associate um, in a user experience lab. I love tennis. I had tickets for a US Open for tonight's game, but of course I couldn't go. Uh, cricket, reading, and a lot of traveling. So I'll start with Waterfall. How many of you are software engineers here? Did you ever work in Waterfall methodology, or everyone is agile? Waterfall? Both? That's good. Um, then I'll move on to agile and the best practices, lean startup principles, and then I'll talk about lean UX and how agile and lean startup principles work well together in user experience. So as most of you might know that uh, Waterfall has sequential steps. First, it's the requirements analysis, where the analysts will get you the requirements. It might take months together. Then the developer and the systems analyst will design the product, build it, then send it to QA. It is a set of sequential steps rather than iterative, where you keep on making changes or deliver small tasks at a time. In Waterfall, you build the whole product, release it in production, and then if there is an issue, a bug is opened. So analysis, design, development, QA, you add, you add as user acceptance test, and then production and maintenance. There is a lot of documentation involved in waterfall methodology. Um, I have myself worked um, getting requirements analysis docs for over 100 pages. I've created uh, systems design documents, technical design documents, close to 100 pages. And it, it is a lot of waste. There are long, longer release cycles because you're actually building the whole product before releasing it, unlike Agile. And in Waterfall, the requirements are really well understood. That's why the requirements stages just in the beginning when you gather all the requirements and then move on to the next steps. The problems with Agile is, this is one of the biggest, sorry, with Waterfall is, this is one of the biggest problems where because everyone is working Separately, there is not much communication or interaction between the developers and the QA. Developers love to blame the QA people. QA people love to blame the developers. So, and there is no accountability for whatever task uh, you have done. There are a lot of team conflicts. Since the teams are not working together, there is a develop development group, then a QA group. You add us with the business. Hardly people work together unless there is a bug when the QA will contact the developers. There are set meetings every for example, every, every week there'll be a meeting about something, or one meeting to go over the requirements, one meeting to go over the design. There are not too many ad hoc meetings, or ad hoc meetings are not encouraged. Um, sometimes it is very difficult to make changes because you might realize that there is a change needed after the whole product is developed. It might get difficult. And work breakdown structure is just a way where you can show how to create the tasks assigned to each team member. Then comes Agile, and um, it's a really fast-paced, I would say, software development methodology. This is the Agile Software Development Manifesto uh, put forward by Ken Beck, I think, in early 2000s. He's an American software engineer. He's also the creator of XP, Extreme Programming. And if you see on the left-hand side, it talks about individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That just means that there is a lot of interaction required between the team members. Uh, working software over comprehensive documentation. In Agile, you don't have to create a document, hundreds of pages. You just create something that's enough for the developer or the QA person to know what they need to test or the developer to know what they need to design and develop. Uh, customer collaboration, there's a lot of involvement from the business if you're working in the corporation or 
with the customers, whoever is your customer, and responding to change. That means that requirements change a lot, all the time. You, you should expect that. So this is a high level difference between Waterfall and Agile. A lot of documentation in Waterfall, it's sequential. Agile is iterative and incremental. So in Agile, you actually uh, deliver small chunks of uh, functionality over a period of time. You don't have to wait for the whole product to be built to release it into production. In Agile, requirements change. That's perfectly fine, and that's totally expected. And they have frequent releases. So for example, for us at Fidelity, what we used to do was we had uh, two, two two weeks iterations, and at the end of the second iteration, uh, we will have the product release. There are companies who do releases in production almost every day, multiple times a day. I was in financial services, so that wasn't possible because production installs take a lot of time, and in financial services, downtime is not, not a good idea. Uh, but I think Flickr does it a few times every day. Uh, TripAdvisor does it every week. So there are companies that do it very, very frequently. The shortcomings for Agile are that there is a learning curve. I moved from Waterfall to using Agile, and I know that it was a very, very big challenge. It is a great idea if you have Agile coaches who are going to help you out, getting used to the new environment. For us, it was not just a new methodology, but also a new proje project. But helping, having coaches help you out with the methodology is really, really helpful. The releases can be really stressful. Uh, I'm speaking from my experience because it was financial services. We used to have releases over the weekends. Sometimes it'll take the whole weekend. You're on call. If something goes wrong, you have to be available. So it's not the most fun thing to do. And continuous customer involvement is not always easy because sometimes you get stuck and you really need feedback from the customer or the, for us it was the portfolio managers or investment managers and they are not always, always available. Scrum is just a type of uh, agile software development methodology that, that we used at Fidelity. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about best practices or what worked really well for us. One is the war rooms. War rooms are nothing but team meeting rooms which are assigned to each project. So we had one room dedicated to our project, and whenever there was an issue or a concern or something had to be discussed, we'll just go to that room, the whole team, uh, and discuss whatever needs to be discussed. All the team members, architects, everyone is going to be available. It had all whiteboards all over so that you can really brainstorm through your ideas, come up with a solution, and just go and do it rather than you know, emailing people back and forth. It's better to just go and talk to the person than email and then wait for the response you really waste a lot of time. When you're working in iterations, you are really held accountable for things that you don't do. You, you really need to be aware of the time, and you just cannot afford to lose time because you cannot meet the person. Uh, the next is small tracks or teams. Ours was a very, very big project, so we had actually multiple teams or multiple tracks, and each track had six to eight people. One, one, or two, one analyst usually, one to two app developers, one to two DB developers, and mostly two QA people. So we used to have multiple uh, daily scrums for each of these tracks. Daily scrum is nothing but a 10 minute, maximum 15 minutes get together for each track. We used to meet every day in the morning at 9.15. Uh, each team member goes over the tasks they're working on what they worked on yesterday, what they're going to work on today, and if there are any issues, it'll be discussed during the Scrum. That way, you don't wait for you know, another day to actually discuss the issues, because nothing should be blocking at any point in time. The moment it is blocking, raise it in the Scrum meetings, or just have a meeting in the war rooms. One of the things that we realized uh, following Scrum was that since interaction is encouraged, People are always interacting, so there is no time we used to get where we could actually focus and develop or code. So we used to have a quiet time from, two, uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. where unless it is absolutely necessary, you're not supposed to go and just chat with people. Retrospective is another amazing uh, practice. So retrospective is nothing but a meeting that we have at the end of each iteration where all the team members come 
and they'll discuss what worked well during the iteration, what did not work well, and what they can improve on so that in the next iteration they don't run into the same issues again. We also, pair programming is uh, a practice that is taken from extreme programming where two programmers work together. So we had a separate uh, machine next to the architect's office where we could anytime go and discuss whatever we are working on. There'll be another person watching over you to see if you're doing the right thing or not. It really, really helps to note down any issues that might arise while you're developing. It helps. Test-driven development, has anyone done it here? Um, on the database side? No? So we used UDPL SQL for test-driven development, driven development and uh, application people used to do JUnit testing, but this really, really helps. What you need to do is that you need to write your tests before you write your code. How that helps is that you end up writing better quality code, and then as a result, there are less bugs in QA. Uh, this I already covered. How frequently should you be having product releases? How frequently do you guys have it? Sorry? Every week? Flickr does it every day, and I'm not, I, I guess they don't worry about the downtime or some, somewhere, some company like Fidelity Investments who are trading every day. They can't do it every day, but. It's amazing that people do it every day. Every week is also actually very interesting. That's what continuous delivery is. The main point is that you're able to build something, test it, and deliver it as fast as possible into production. Next, uh, I'll talk about Lean Startup. Has anyone read the book? It's a good book, right? It's amazing. Um, so while I talk about this, I'm just going to give you a scenario, which I'll go over again and again during the Lean Talk. Uh, this is a startup. It's my husband's startup. It's a mobile application for making uh, payments through a mobile phone. It's based in Turkey. And what you do is the merchant has a merchant app uh, that has a QR code reader. And me, as an end user, I can go to the merchant or a cafe or a bar if they accept that Pay mode of payment, what I do is I just use my phone that has a QR code and make the payment uh, through the app. And their app, their app will just read the QR code that's on my phone. Lean startup concepts. Uh, most of you might know that it originated in Japan with Toyota Production Systems. Uh, it is a set of tools that assist in identification and elimination of waste. The biggest thing with Agile and Lean is that you don't end up building something that is not needed, that customers don't need. As a result, you end up saving a lot of code, a lot of your time, and hence a lot of money too. Um, as the waste is eliminated, quality improves and cost is reduced. Validated learning. Business plans, in case of Lean, I personally don't believe in the huge business plan documents that are out there, which some people still follow. Uh, but business plans should definitely have, in today's world, a set of assumptions which you're going to validate before you even build the product. And that is called validated learning. You go out and talk to the customers and make sure that your assumptions are right before even building the product. Uh, there is this term called customer development. Uh, this is the exercise that, exercise that you go through when you go out. You really need to make sure that there is a product market fit. Unless, unless you're sure about that, you should not be building the product because you might end up building something that there is no need in the market. Of course, there are exceptions to it, but it is always, always a good idea to find the product market fit, and that's what's customer development. Getting out of the building is in a way, one of the most important and one of the most difficult things to do. What this means is that you cannot be sitting at your desk and assuming that whatever you have come up with is correct and just start building the product. You really need to go out and talk to the customers. Another thing is, it is a very good idea to actually observe the people. Uh, Tomer Sharon, who wrote the uh, book It's Our Research, he, he always says that don't listen to the users, but observe them, which is true in a way because they may not tell you everything, not because they don't want to tell you, but they may not feel the need. But if you really observe them, the way they, for example, make a payment at a cafe or 
anything, you will learn a lot more. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, customer archetype is similar to a persona. That is your target market. Uh, value hypothesis is to make sure that whatever you're building, it actually delivers value to the customer. And growth hypothesis is uh, test how the new customers will actually even identify or find your product or discover your product. Another very important concept in Lean Startup is the build, measure, learn feedback loop. What this really means is that you, when you build something, you need to make sure that you're building the right thing. So you measure, you meet the customers, get feedback, and make sure that that's what they need. Because you don't want to end up building something that they don't need. And whenever they give a response to you, either you're building the right thing or you're not building the right thing, you need to change. If you're building the right thing, if your assumptions are correct, great. Otherwise, you really need to pivot. And the, it's very important. It's not just you measure, but also learn and make changes. In the beginning, I always struggled, even with my own startup, I always struggled to understand what exactly should I add to the MVP, and every day I'm changing my mind. MVP is the smallest version to test your hypotheses. It doesn't have to have everything, all the features. Just the most important features, which are difficult to test, you need to test first. It should require the least amount of effort and development time. Um, it will lack many features, don't worry about it. And prototyping plays a very important role because prototypes can be one of the ways you can go out to the customers and show, and that can be your MVP. You need to measure, get feedback, and most importantly, you need to act on it. And with every feedback you're getting, you're learning if you're doing the right thing or not. If not, make changes. One of the MVP rules is that remove any feature, process, or effort that does not contribute directly to the learning you seek. So it is very important that whatever you're building for the MVP, you're learning something out of it. If you're not, you're building the wrong thing. for M That's not an MVP. Pivot is change in course or strategy. It can really change your business, your business model, everything. It's very difficult for the founder or the team to accept that you know, whatever they have built is not what is needed. And it is very difficult to pivot, to accept that you need to pivot. You really need a lot of courage for that. The whole idea is that you realize it on time before you build the whole product and everything is out, and then you realize, oh, this is not working out. So after the MVP, you will get to know if you need to pivot or not. When to pivot, if the hypothesis is proven to be false, you need to take action. That will really save time, effort, and money. Concierge MVP is another uh, term used in Lean Startup Concepts. What this basically means is that you are manually going to help the user understand the product you have built or the solution you're coming up with. One of the examples that's given in the book, or I read somewhere, is uh, the coupons business. So instead of having a system generate all those coupons, you can actually deliver the coupons to the customers manually and see if they're using it or not. You don't have to build a system to do that. And if they're using it, you can slowly build, build a system. This can also help decide when the pivot is needed, and it can happen even if the MVP was successful. The whole point of concierge is that you are working very closely with the user, and you're telling them what to do to get feedback. So let's take the example I talked about uh, for the mobile payments. If you think of it, what do you think should be the features of an MVP in that app? There's a merchant app, and there is a consumer app. So for the merchant app, the main idea is that they're able to accept payments from the customers who have the uh, consumer app. So for the merchant app, the main thing is that they should be able to accept payments. And for the consumer app, they should be able to register, they should add the credit card information, and they should the QR code should be generated, that's it. It's very tempting to add all the social media check-ins and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You really don't need to do all that. You just need to do the MVP part, and then uh, see how it works, and then keep on adding features, be iterative and incremental. In the merchant app, you really don't need to care of the transaction history given in the app right now. Because even though merchants care, you can always give them in other ways. You can always generate a report by querying the database directly. It doesn't have to be in the app for the MVP. 
the whole purpose of the MVP is to decide what you're testing, and that is, are the customers going to use my app to make payments? This is another question that I, I have personally always struggled with. How important is quality and design in an MVP? It is important and it is not. You can always do, you can always talk to the customers, do some initial research, and it'll give you a lot of answers about what you should be building. In that case, you can even have paper prototypes, but there is a stage at which you really need to build something, be it a prototype, high fidelity or medium fidelity, and show it to the customers. So it really depends what you are really trying to get out of that testing. Uh, more lean examples. Uh, Zappos is a very, very good one. Uh, so the founder of Zappos did not build, that's an online shoe retailer. I, I guess Amazon bought it a few years ago. The founder did not build the platform. He just went to the shoe stores and asked the owner that if I could just take pictures of the shoes and I'll put it up online. And if people want to buy it, I'll come back and buy it for the full price. That's what he did. And he realized that there was a lot of demand. And then he ended up building the system. Another one is um, Date My Wardrobe that I started. So Date My Wardrobe idea actually started with a shoe share service. And as we went out and talked to people, shoe share service just for women, we realized that people are willing to share not just their shoes, but even other wardrobe items. And even guys are willing to share stuff like ties and their tux or suits. So it expanded. Again, that is, that is why the user research is very, very important. Otherwise, I could have just built a system for shoe share service and then realized, oh, guess what? They need other stuff, too. So Lean Startup Recap, um, MVP, the minimum viable product. Fail quickly and cheaply in order to succeed. The build, measure, learn feedback loop we talked about. You really need to decide when to pivot and if it is needed or not. You can start learning very, very early in the whole development cycle. You don't have to wait for the product to be built to start learning. And observe the customer behavior rather than ask what they want. As Steve Jobs used to say, customers don't always know what they want. To an extent, it is true. They don't know what they want. Many times, they may not know what they want, and they might, answering, they might end up answering something they don't mean. Lean UX and user research. User research is something that has been there for a very long time, but I think now it has got a lot of hype because of lean startup, lean UX, all these principles. Uh, the foundations of lean UX basically are three, design thinking, agile, and the lean startup principles that I just talked about. In terms of design thinking, what this really means is you really need to match people's needs with what is possible or feasible using whatever technology you're using and make, make sure that whatever you're building is what the people want. Ideation, prototyping, and implementation, and learning steps. This is the same set of principles that we talked about in Lean Startup. It is a solution-focused approach to problem solving. That's why people come first. This is just a comparison of uh, Lean Startup build, measure, learn, feedback loop and uh, the think, make, check, UX cycle. When we talk about the design thinking, we don't end up building the design or something. That's why it says think, make, and then check. It's basically the same idea that you, you're learning while designing also. Uh, Jeff is the author of the book UX Designer and, sorry, of the book Lean UX, Applying Lean Principles to Improve User Experience. And he says that Lean UX is where prototyping shines. There are different ways in which you can bring the product in front of the user. Uh, it can be any of these fidelities, low, medium, high. It really depends on what you're trying to get out of that experiment, out of that um, conversation with the user. If you can go code fast well enough, then you can definitely do that. But paper prototypes works, um, medium fidelity, every, all of these works. It just needs to, you just need to know what uh, you're trying to achieve out of the conversation. As I said earlier, uh, UX has been out there for a very long time, and especially the user-centered design. And if you need to compare it with lean UX, it is definitely not replacing uh, UCD. UCD. In UCD, also, you'll end up learning from users, and the same is true for lean UX. The difference is that in, 
UCD, there are no agile concepts. It's not iterative or incremental. You don't validate any hypotheses. Uh, and you don't end up measuring any of the design outcomes, which is true in case of Lean UX. Lean UX and Agile, um, very, very, very highly encouraged that it's cross-functional teams and all the team members work together. QA developers, designers, they are not separate. They all have to work together towards finishing a story or a task given to them. As a result of this, there is greater accountability because if I'm working on a story or a task following Agile methodology, if I'm working well with the QA and the app developers, it'll work great. I have seen in my own experience that in Agile, you don't end up blaming the QA people or uh, app developers that it's their fault. It really, really helps uh, build the team. And it's everyone's responsibility, and everyone works hard towards finishing a story. There is a lot of uh, in uh, conversation that's encouraged. Limited documentation, it should be enough to communicate the design. You don't have to build fancy uh, design documents, 10 diagrams explaining the same thing. You just don't have to do that. Even uh, you just go to the war room or any room and draw whatever you're going to design or develop or whatever, and just take a picture. And that can be a part of your design document. It does not have to be fancy. It depends from company to company, but I think it's really, really enough. This is a very uh, good slide that I found online. I had Agile experience. And when I was reading Lean UX and Lean Startup, I realized that there are a lot of similarities. This slide actually explains it really very, very, very well. Traditional UX, it's design and usability. Um, it basically means what we are thinking, what we're going to build. If you think of UX and you think of waterfall, I haven't worked in UX using waterfall, but each step, like design, um, develop, all, all the steps have UX in them. UX also goes the same way, the same cycle. In Agile UX, there is a lot of collaboration, and you really need to de deliver something. How do we make it? Whereas in Lean UX, in addition to all that, you're also learning and making sure that what you're building is the right thing. Are we making the right thing? Lean UX is data driven. Don't assume that whenever you release a new feature, don't assume that even if it is, uh, you have tested that this is what the users want, you really need to validate, look at the matrix, and make sure that this is the right thing that you have done. Test everything. You can't learn if you don't measure, which is very true. I was at a conference in San Francisco uh, in February this year where product designer of Facebook, she shared, uh, before they reached the, a billion users, they were struggling, and they realized that not too many people were registering. And then they looked at the matrix, and they checked at what point are users stopping or not moving forward in Facebook. And one of the things they realized was during registration. Because registration um, initially was very lengthy. They used to have all the details that they needed. Then they used to have email confirmation, email validation, captures. And then they realized that this is really not needed. We can just have the person register with their email uh, password and very, very little information. And they realized they actually had millions of users sign up after they just changed the registration process. So it's very important that the data that you're getting, you really make use of it to make the whole experience better for the user. Validate. Uh, in Lean UX, you look at the product as a set of hypotheses, as I discussed before, rather than a set of features. Lean UX is not about adding features. It is about understanding customers' problems and validating them. You come up with an idea, talk to customers, validate. And then you design, create prototypes, meet the customers again, and make sure that it's easy for them to use. It makes sense to them. And then that will result in the end product. User research for validation. Uh, one of them is landing page test. You, whenever you are coming with a new startup, you can have a landing page. It doesn't have to be functional. But at least, for example, you can have an email sign up. Or you can have a button that people will click if they're interested in the product. For example, you can say that if you want an early invite or uh, exclusive invite when the product is ready, sign up. And people do end up doing that. You can drive traffic using AdWords and Facebook ads. 
And it is always a good idea once you've reached a certain stage where you can actually sh show people the real product or I would say medium to high fidelity prototype and get feedback. I'm going to talk about uh, interviews as a way to learn. It's great to understand detailed motivations towards a particular design. Interviews are basically one-on-one -on -one where I can meet with the customer and learn from them what they think of the gap that exists right now and the solution that we are providing. A conversation is needed. It can be totally open-ended, not finite answers. It is environment independent in most cases where it doesn't matter where you meet the person. And there should be a few users available for you to make sense out of all the data that you're gathering from all these interviews. It can be structured, closed questions, unstructured, open-ended questions, free text, or semi-structured, which I always prefer, mix of both. Facilitator tips, interact informally. It's very important for you to make the user comfortable. Otherwise, you won't be getting the answers you really need from them. Observe the user. Let the user think it's fine if, they, if they're quiet, if they get totally silent. Come back on track if the user is distracted, which happens quite a few times. There is something called a moderator's guide, which you use even in usability tests. Always use that as a guide and not you know, just look at the questions and then ask the user. Because you can get a lot more than what's there in the guide by responding to the user based on what they're saying. And restate when necessary. Interviews, what is important, what you really need to gather, any contradictory information if you compare it to what you've already found in your research. What is it in the design that frustrates the user? And any feedback, or user might say, oh, it might be helpful if in future I can get the photographs from Instagram rather than uploading a new photo or something like that. Even though it's not there in the mod guide, you're that's something you're learning. And watch for body language. Remote interviews are acceptable if the environment doesn't play a role. You can use FaceTime, Skype, Hangouts, WebEx, anything. Service is another way, and basically it is used online, especially uh, when you need to gather a lot of data. It can be administered online or offline. They sometimes can be complex. It's a very good way to observe trends, because if you're getting so much of data, you can actually come up with trends, like 50% or 60% of the users say they like Instagram or something like that. And whenever you create surveys, I've realized it myself, it is always good to actually review the survey with someone else. Uh, before you actually make it public and pilot it. When to use when the answers are finite and a large amount of data is needed. It is very important the way you actually write questions in a survey because it can mean different things to different users. That's another reason why you should actually review it with someone else before you make it public. It can be MCQ format or free text. Tools, it can be web-based, even emails or paper-based. And ideally, short as a survey, the more answers you will get and more accurate answers you will get. You should set expectations. It is always a good idea to let the user know how long the survey is and what it is for, rather than you know, having 100 questions. User is definitely going to quit. Include the subject of the survey purpose and your contact information in case they have any questions. And it is better to have multiple surveys of smaller length than you have one huge survey. Another. Um, User research method is ethnography, which I really like. When uh, I came up with the shoe, shoe so, chair idea, um, I took this idea to Boston uh, Service Design Weekend. And we were a group of people from uh, my university. And we actually went to different shoe shops. And we just observed the people over there. Like, what are they buying? What are their reactions? What frustrates them? And we ended up talking to people over there. And that's when we realized it's not just the shoes that they are willing to share, but other wardrobe items too. Minimal or no interaction. You can always have a follow-up, but the main idea is that you just go and observe them. It's a complex domain. Um, you really need to study the real environment. You really need to be at the place where users are. What you look for is terminology. If there's a new or a different terminology they are using, their frustrations, inefficiencies, and any challenges they run into. Competitor testing is another really good one. I have done that when I was working at the research lab. 
uh, webs.com and wix.com. Webs.com is a, these two are platforms for building websites. And we did a test for webs.com, uh, but what they did was they actually did a test for wix.com also to get in, uh, feedback from the users if they prefer wix or web, and if they prefer wix, why? And if they prefer web, why? That was really, really, it had very good insights. Landing page goal. Whenever you have a landing page, for example, for a startup, the main idea is that whoever is visiting the landing page, they actually sign up. That is a very, very big thing to do, a very difficult one as well. For that, you can do A-B testing. You can have two different landing pages and get feedback from customers or users and see uh, which one is better. FiveSecondTest.com is an amazing tool where you can just put a screenshot of two landing pages that you have for the same purpose and get feedback from users, 20, 50, 100. It'll really tell you a lot. And then you can decide which one is a better one and use that one in production. The main purpose is that you're focusing on branding, messaging, and call to action, making sure that people do end up taking an action when they visit your website. And not, it's not about the views, but it's about the action they take, that they sign up. It is a good practice not to give a guided tour to the user during testing, because you, don't wanna, you wanna learn from them. You don't wanna tell them what it does. If you end up telling them this is what it does, then that will really constrain their mind, and they won't actually say what they would have otherwise. Uh, Lean UX recap, validating hypotheses. Uh, it is user-centered, agile, data-driven. Um, Lean UX is fast and cheap sometimes. Whenever you think of that, you think of waste. And it is iterative. Think of MVP, that you're constantly learning. For user research, there are a lot of other methods, but I just talked about interview surveys and ethnography. Uh, I attended the Lean UX New York City conference in April, and these were some of the really, really good quotes out there. I guess these slides are going to be available somewhere. Are these slides going to be available online? Yeah. Feel free to check them out. That's it. Questions? Hi. Um, how do you um, deconvolute the effects on metrics between the UX changes and, and functional changes to, the, to your application or whatever? For UX, as I talked about the example at Facebook, you're capturing every time the user comes, you're capturing whenever they, at what stage they leave. So you know where exactly the problem is in terms of UX. How, how, are, you, how are you separating a UX effect between a, a functional effect? So if there was another, another stage to the uh, registration process, that's kind of a functional thing rather than a UX thing? By logging it. That is the best way. Even gathering matrix, you're logging it. OK. So you, you could tell that they stopped because of a UX feature rather than a functional feature. If it is a registration, it is very clear that it is um, UX. OK. Um, let me think of, can you give a, an example of functional? Uh, just like an another um, bit of friction towards the sign up process. So, so having like email validation. That's, that's not really, uh, I wouldn't say it's UX, I'd say it's to do with your um, authentication or something like that. So how would you know they stopped because of a, a, a graphical thing on the, on the front end or that authentication? So you can do end? it in steps. So don't make all the changes at the same time. Sure. And then see when the users actually stop. Is it because of the emails or is it because of an extra field? Okay. No more questions? All clear? All right. Thank you.